Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be in Hong Kong, to be at Chinese University of Hong Kong, and I thank you for the invitation. Um, what an exciting city. Just, just coming in is the buzz of a global city. In case I am too long-winded, but I will try to be brief, there are really just three points I would like to make, and so I will make them immediately. <laughs> I think there are three, at least that's what I thought when I wrote the abstract for my talk, <laughs> three critical challenges uh, for the health system in global cities. That's my general proposition. First the enormous problem of inequalities. Second, the danger of contagion of infectious disease. And third, the challenge of dealing with a aging population and all of the chronic disease associated with aging. That's all. Now let me try to provide some context for this. I think that all over the world, the health sector generally faces really quite formidable challenges. Uh, the rapid pace of innovation, which already has been alluded to, population aging and the rise of chronic disease, which already mentioned, with more specifically the rise of diabetes, heart disease, cancer as leading causes of death in uh, all over the world today, except the very, very, very poorest countries. And the dangers posed by the transmission of infectious diseases and their spread as numbers of people traveling around the world continue to increase. And about 10 years ago, there were about a million people crossing international borders every day. That figure has no doubt doubled by now, but I haven't seen the latest. Um, there are severe inequalities, as I mentioned, in population health, whether you, whatever measure you take, and not just in population health, and I would like to make that distinction, but in access to health care, which is not necessarily the same as population health. Now, by 2000, 50, the United Nations uh, division that projects population change projects that 70% of the world's population will be living in cities. That's why I think this conference about health challenges in global cities is particularly important. Because in global cities, places like Hong Kong, New York, London, Paris, and many other cities, uh, Shanghai, we could go to San Paolo, Mumbai, Moscow, in the BRIC countries, go to poorer countries, Lagos, Cairo, Jakarta. The health sector challenges, I think, are even more formidable. That's what I would argue. They are more formidable. Why? Because that is where, in these cities, the population growth has been the highest. Not necessarily the highest rate of aging, but yes, the highest concentrations of older people are living in these cities, and that's almost tautological, simply because these cities are the concentrations of the largest populations. So if you look for a kind of laboratory in order to see what happens to the world in countries where there are a lot of older people concentrated, you look to the largest cities with the largest populations which have the largest concentrations of older populations. That's the basis on which I started many years ago, I think it's been over a decade, working with my colleague Michael Guzmano on something we called the World Cities Project. And we actually did a book about growing older in world cities, which I think needs to be updated already. And so conferences like this are most helpful. Um, in addition to the fact that global cities concentrate large populations and large older populations, global cities, many of them, not all of them, but most of them, are gateway cities. 
They have large airports, they have large populations coming in from all over the world, and therefore they are vectors, potentially, for the transmission of contagious disease. These cities are also places where, like in Hong Kong, the population has high expectations. There's high visibility. Global cities in general, because all these reasons, are strategic locations, I think, for observing health sector challenges and for studying health sector's challenges. And I think that they emerge from the characteristics of these cities, some of which I've already alluded to, but I'd like to say a few more words about them. First, a word about why global cities and their surrounding regions are important. I don't know if you remember, probably you do, that photograph that was taken, I think, from the moon of the Earth many years ago, and the part of the Earth that was dark had these lights that illuminated. Well, these lights that illuminated the Earth were not national boundaries, they were cities. These, not to be mistaken with the thousand points of lights of one of our former presidents, but these were far less than a thousand points of life. These were points of light that point to global cities. They are important, not just because of this photograph, but there's a recent book by a political scientist, Benjamin Barber, a provocative book. He may be wrong, it's still worth paying attention to, in which he argues uh, that cities will rule the world. That's not an unimportant topic in a city like this one. <laughs> uh, a report by the McKinsey Associates by the same title suggests that in the 21st century, the world will not be dominated by the United States, nor will it be dominated by China, nor Brazil or India, but it will be dominated by cities. In a world that appears increasingly ungovernable, Barber would argue, and there's a lot of evidence for that, cities may in fact be the strategic locations where issues of governance are resolved, where problems are resolved. That's an intriguing hypothesis. It makes global cities an interesting place to study, an important place to study, and particularly to look at issues of healthcare and all of the ethical issues which will emerge from the challenges that I will describe. Many argue that cities get things done. They're able to control pollution, they can do congestion pricing, they can organize health systems, According to uh, Parekh Khanna at the McKinsey Company, who wrote that monograph on when cities rule the world, and this is an intriguing figure, 40 city regions today account for two-thirds of the world's economy. 40 city regions, and Hong Kong is one of them. And so is Paris in the larger scheme, and New York City and London. And they account, therefore, for two-thirds of the total world economy and most of its innovation. That applies to all of the world cities I've been studying with Dr. Cosmano. They are all centers of economic growth and finance. In fact, Saskia Sassen, a distinguished sociologist, wrote a book many years ago called The Global City, in which she argued that these global cities are really the nerve center of the entire global economy, and that the decisions that are made in New York, London, Hong Kong, are the decisions that control the world economy. These cities are not just centers of finance and economic growth, they're also centers of media and culture. When something happens in Paris, it zooms right across the world today, first and foremost, to the cities and then um, um, they are, have impressive transportation systems. I had great evidence of that last night as I came in from the airport. It's a truly excellent system here in Hong Kong. We can only imagine that in New York. It has yet to come. Um, there are innovations of all kinds. Another uh, writer about these cities, Richard Florida, suggests that these global cities are the home to what he calls the creative classes. Now this kind of bravado about global cities tends to be believed by most people who live in global cities. Indeed, there's a certain pride about each global city and being the best of its kind, 
so good that it can never be compared with other cities. And so the purpose of much of what I've done with Michael Gusmano in the field of healthcare is to break down that myth and say that in fact the, re the reason they're so good uh, doesn't make them not comparable with other places. In fact, they should be compared to one another. And we continually call for more research comparing global cities to one another to see what one can learn from that. And I would like to bring that up at the end of this conference for our discussion. Now we get to healthcare. Global cities are all, as Michael pointed out, uh, centers for excellence in medical care, all have great hospitals, top-ranking medical schools, institutes for biomedical research, and places where, as you have seen demonstrated in Hong Kong, there's a strong capacity in what's called public health infrastructure. By that I mean highly skilled public health personnel, highly performance-driven laboratories, and highly competent surveillance capabilities in healthcare. But, and here's where I get to my main point, along with this rosy, optimistic view of world cities or of global cities, they also attract, and this is a fact, some of the wealthiest people of the countries in which they live, and at the same time, they attract many of the poorest. In fact, one of the characteristics of world cities is this combination of very, very wealthy people and very, very poor people living together in high-density environments. I think I even had a slide. Sometimes a photo really is worth a thousand words. But I've seen this, as many of you who visited New York go as tourists to Wall Street, and if you happen to not take a limousine, but go into the New York subway, you see that Wall Street has both sides, a lot of money and a lot of poverty. Well, consider the contrast between the slum and the gated communities. Uh, this photograph was taken from an Oxfam publication um, at the BRICS Policy Center in Rio de Janeiro. These glaring inequalities. Uh, between the tennis courts and swimming pools and gated community together with the slums uh, is not unique to the city in which it was taken. We have this in all of our global cities. And anyone who would wish to dispute that uh, I think would have a strong opposition on the other side. I mean, often there are attempts to gloss over it, but I think that this is very important in dealing with the healthcare sector. So we have this problem of inequalities in population health, first of all. In a conference that was held here in Hong Kong about two years ago where Dr. Jean Wu and I both attended, um, the Urban Age Project from London run out of the London School of Economics, uh, some analysis was done about greater regions where the comparison was made of life expectancy at birth in Paris, which was 82, at the time, Bucharest 74, Ho Chi Minh City 74, and Hong Kong 82.5. So just across the world cities, there's a bit of a contrast. But the more staggering contrasts are the kinds of contrasts one finds within all world cities. There's a famous map that epidemiologists love to show of the London subway, in which uh, on the map, it's pointed out the life expectancy, I, I, Excuse my American English, I should have said the London Underground. <laughs> no. uh, the female life expectancy in Westminster, near Kensington, uh, is 84.2 years. In Canning Town, it's 80.6 years. We have a four year difference. In Glasgow, in Hanlow, a very poor part of Glasgow, 2006, men lived till the age of 54, whereas in Lansey, they lived to the age of 82. I should point out that often these data are not available to the public, which perhaps poses an ethical question for some of our experts in the latter part of the conference about information. It's not always easy to get data disaggregated to this level, but it is extraordinarily important to do so, I believe. <laughs> 
In Hong Kong, at this Urban Age Conference, the following figures were released, and I put them before you for verification, that the rate of premature mortality in Hong Kong uh, at the time of the conference, two, three years ago, was 210 per 100,000. But in some of the most deprived areas of Hong Kong, the figure was twice that, 420. In New York City, my city, it, uh, an article was published about 20 years ago, much to the dismay of the New York City Department of Health, which indicated that in Harlem, which is one of our New York neighborhoods that's been famous throughout the world, for its jazz, among other things. Life expectancy at birth for men was 60, not so far from the life expectancy in Bangladesh. The New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene considered that an inappropriate comparison. Uh, it has improved since then. Uh, my point is that there are severe inequalities in life expectancy at birth. One can't get more, uh, a better statistic to show the nature of inequality than how long people actually live. Now that doesn't reflect necessarily the healthcare system. I would like to be clear about that. That reflects what epidemiologists call the social uh, factors uh, behind health. Uh, the social determinants of health is what, in, 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 what epidemiologists call it. But at the same time, um, there are problems of access to health care. And to the extent that health care can contribute, and it does contribute at the margin to population health, most of us working in health care believe that it is very important to provide access to health care, particularly primary health care, to the inhabitants of any city. What we have in these global cities are prestigious academic medical centers that provide some of the best, what we call tertiary and quadrinary services, yet in their shadow lie large swaths of the population who face significant obstacles in all of these cities to accessing some of the most basic services, and sometimes they have difficulty in obtaining appropriate disease prevention services and primary care services. Our group, uh, Michael Guzmano, Dan Weiss, and I, and other colleagues, have examined an indicator of access to care, uh, one we call avoidable hospital conditions, and that's how do we avoid people being hospitalized for conditions for which, if they received adequate primary care, they would never show up in the hospital? But when they do, they need to be in the hospital. I won't talk about that one for the moment. I'll talk about an even broader one, which we call, and it's not our indicator, uh, which we call avoidable mortality. There are some conditions one should not die of. I'll give you an example. Um, we define avoidable mortality. I'm going to have to point to the left. It's not my political orientation necessarily, but I can't point to both at the same time. I'm, uh, forgive me. There. Uh, we, define, we define avoidable mortality. Do I have uh, 10 more minutes? Good. Okay. We, we, we define avoidable mortality as deaths before the age of 75 years from diseases that are amenable to screening and to medical intervention. Some examples include ischemic heart disease. Uh, if you have blood pressure control, proper medication, for, uh, you can avoid dying for ischemic heart disease, or at least a large number of deaths can be avoided with proper uh, surveillance and primary care. Same thing for malignancies of the breast, of the colon, of the cervix, of the skin. One, one can avoid dying from these conditions if you have access to proper medical care. Not in every case, but these are probabilistic uh, issues. You can certainly avoid dying from tuberculosis when you get appropriate treatment. And women should never die in childbirth when there's appropriate care available. And yet people do die 
from all of these conditions. So the indicator of avoidable mortality tells you something not just about the social determinants of disease, and it, it goes beyond life expectancy in actually focusing to some extent on, on, on what the health system contributes. And so it becomes an important indicator in assessing and comparing different global cities across one from the other and also comparing neighborhoods within individual global cities for which it's often hard to get data but we have gotten data for some, and we have several publications uh, looking at that. Our most recent publication, which was a great challenge for us because we just started this about three years ago when we went to Shanghai after working in Hong Kong, and it's just been published last week in the International uh, Journal of Health Policy and Management in which we looked at avoidable mortality in Shanghai. Uh, we've, we've not gotten the data over time to look at this in Hong Kong. Uh, we'd like to do that someday. Uh, and what, what you see for uh, Shanghai, what we found, is that the avoidable mortality uh, decreased from 0 0.72 in 2000 to uh, 0 0.38 in 2010. Now that's not unique because it decreased, in fact, in, in uh, New York, it decreased in London, and it decreased in Paris, which is actually lower than Shanghai, but Shanghai does very well compared to Paris and London. However, when we look at Shanghai, we are only looking, I'm sorry, at the registered population. We have no data for the non-permanent residents, therefore it's not really a perfect comparison. Nevertheless, we published this to show what we can know with the data that we have, not knowing enough about the non-registered population so that we can still say, great progress has been made in Shanghai, without a doubt, and great investments have been made in Shanghai. But there's still a big problem, we think, of inequality, and that's recognized, with those who don't have the same benefits, and so it would be important in the next step of this analysis to do some comparisons across neighborhoods of Shanghai and to see what one could learn about the population that does not have access to the health insurance and the goods. This is what this kind of indicator can begin to show, and this is what I mean uh, by the challenge of uh, inequality. Now let me go on to the next point. The two final challenges, and I can be brief here, because these are more understood, I believe, are the risk of contagious disease. Uh, we all have these images in our mind. In Hong Kong, you've experienced what SARS can mean to the life of a city. Uh, today, we've experienced uh, more in New York uh, than, than you ever experienced the, the risk of Ebola with a very small number of cases. Uh, but what, what, what this means is that imagine there was avian flu, H5N1. That would be far more serious than what we've seen with Ebola. Global cities are without a doubt incubators for all kinds of bacteria some of them able to spread around the world at unprecedented rates. And so the second challenge is how to develop a public health infrastructure uh, which includes what's called systems of syndromic surveillance uh, and capability for rapid analysis and transmission of clinical data, laboratory reports, and uh, collaboration with skilled public health workforce so that we know right away when there's a problem. In New York, the system works rather well. Uh, and in Hong Kong, it works rather well too now after the SARS epidemic. Uh, and in Paris and London, it's improving greatly. Uh, for example, we have systems now of syndromic surveillance where when you call 911, which is the emergency line, this is tracked day in and day out. And if there are changes in the pattern of calls, 
right away that signals that there might be a problem. There's a whole system of monitoring all the emergency rooms to see what the pattern of emergencies are. So that if that pattern changes, right away the Department of Health knows that. This requires a collaboration between clinicians who are doing individual patient care and public health people who are analyzing the data. And this kind of work is one way to meet the challenges. Now, I'm just dealing today in my talk with the challenges. The rest of this conference can think about the ethical issues involved in meeting the challenges. But, but I, I put it on the table. We're going to need, and we already have, more and more information about our whole population. And this is going to raise issues of individual privacy, the greater good for the greater number, and I assume that there will be some heated discussion about where that should go. I, I, I leave it at that for the second, and now I go to the third challenge uh, of aging. Uh, now, I'm not one, and I know nor is Dr. Wu, of those who suggest, as some people do, that aging will be the death of all of us, even though we will die at the end. Uh, but there are, there are those, uh, Pete Peterson, who paint a gloomy picture of, of aging and say that this is a more global problem than anything else that may worry us at night, more than nuclear proliferation, more than, uh, uh, than, than bioterrorism, uh, that aging will destroy our social security systems, will destroy our health systems, and so forth. Uh, I don't subscribe to that view, but I do subscribe to the view that I think anyone does, uh, that aging will force us to change the way we organize our healthcare system. And that's the point on which I think I would like to focus here. Uh, but uh, let me repeat that the combination of rising urbanization around the world and population aging around the world make these global cities the place where even if the rate of aging is not necessarily the highest, it always has the highest concentration of older people. They don't live with the same densities across the cities. There are some neighborhoods with much higher rates of aging, some with much lower. This makes aging a really interesting issue to study in cities, and I believe there should be more studies uh, of how neighborhoods compare, because neighborhoods are increasingly thought to be important determinants of the quality of life for older people. Uh, it's not just an individual matter of chronology. It's a matter of quality of life. It's a matter of density. It's a matter of neighborhood. It's a matter of services. It's a matter of working. It, it, it involves a whole set of complex issues, which I'm sure Jean Wu will describe further as she has done much work on this. But some of the questions that I find most interesting in meeting this challenge are the following. First, how to assist frail older persons, and eventually older persons do become frail, there's very little way around it, how to assist such persons when they are isolated. Second, how to improve the neighborhood support for vulnerable population before they become vulnerable. How to organize home care services for people who need assistance. How eventually to organize forms of assisted living or nursing homes, uh, and eventually uh, palliative uh, care uh, for older people. Uh, how to make neighborhoods less full of air pollution, and how to control and manage chronic disease. As we get older, we get more chronic diseases, and we can either not treat these chronic diseases and end up in hospitals and die earlier, or we can uh, screen and monitor and treat through primary care and avoid and extend life and quality of life with good health systems. But to do that requires really some major transformation of the way we currently organize healthcare. And every system in the world with which I'm familiar is groping on how to do that. Nobody has figured it out. But it's a combination of better integration, better communication between hospital and primary care, better information systems, better knowledge and self-management, uh, 
uh, by patients. Uh, there's a whole set of ethical issues that this raises about information and diffusion of that information, and some of that we'll deal with on the next panel. I think I've, yes, I've reached my time limit, and I want to leave room for discussion. So I leave you with a final question uh, to which I will not give the answer. And that is, will mega city regions evolve into socially infected breeding grounds for the rapid transformation of disease? That's the pessimistic scenario, that the global city will be the death of all of us. Or, if you're an optimist, can cities, particularly global cities, become critical spatial entities, critical places for the protection and the promotion of population health, and if so, how? Those seem to me to be the big questions. I look forward to discussing some of the possible strategies and answers and the ethical problems that this raises in the course of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Baldwin. May I please invite our session respondent, Professor Jean Wu, onto the stage for discussion, please. Thank you. Uh, let me continue uh, with the stage that Professor Rodwin has set. And I'm going to ask a fundamental ethical question, uh, uh, which is this. Um, all societies are faced with uh, problems, uh, an issue of resource. Um, when you have resource limitations, what, what is the, uh, how do you prioritize? Now, um, long time ago, uh, Dr. Callahan actually put forward an image of a boat uh, filled with people, it's sinking, it's a storm. And a, a scenario beloved of philosophers, whom should we push out? Because if you push out somebody, uh, you've got more chance of the whole group of the remaining group surviving. And, and so the question, is it the oldest, most infirm, the least useless member of society? Uh, or, or how do you decide? Now, um, and it's pertinent to ask in Hong Kong society, uh, although we don't debate ethical questions, most people have their opinions. I'm not sure how they arrive at these opinions. But these opinions do govern what they do. And, and so, you know, you might think about this. Uh, do we subscribe to Daniel Callahan's scenario that we, you know, we, we should, for societal good, push out the weakest? Now, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm going, to, going to highlight some other perspective and assume that we refute this assumption that being old in and of itself does not raise specific ethical questions. Um, so we, we've got to start somewhere, right? <laughs> um, we can talk about the, this debate, other things at lunchtime. Um, and, but but it, it is, it, you just wonder, you know, what, what does our society think? What do the policy makers in particular think? Uh, we, we never talk about it. So it's very good that we have this opportunity to explicitly debate these things. Now, um, if we refute that, then we talk about um, the standard language, uh, the principalist approach, that, that is autonomy, beneficence, doing good, non maleficence not doing harm, uh, and justice or equity. And the interesting question is, can these principles be taught? Uh, or does it seep into culture so that people absorb it? Now, I think that, um, this is the med uh, medical f um, faculty. Uh, I think certainly we ought to make a start in educating healthcare, health and social care professionals that because they're dealing with people, they should be governed by a very strong ethical code. And so I think it's easiest to start with this group um, uh, rather than the general public and talk about the ethics of doing business and so on. But nevertheless, these principles also have to seep into the general public. 
Now, what is the situation in Hong Kong? I'm going to uh, give some examples in response to Professor Rodwin's points. Um, the first point is health inequalities. Hong Kong is a very small, small place, 1,000 square kilometers. Uh, it's a reasonable dropout regions where we have political districts, 18 districts. Uh, they're not particularly based on um, anything logical, <laughs> except a, a kind of historic ge geographical background. But nevertheless, if you use that as a common denominator, we do find market health inequalities uh, across these regions in terms of uh, incidence and case fatality for stroke, in terms of hospital admission for ischemic heart disease, in terms of incidence and case fatality for people with hip fracture, and in terms of uh, incidence of a prevalence of frailty. And there are temporal and spatial variations if you look at the trends, uh, as well as the, uh, the, the shifting pattern uh, it, it, across time. So very interesting what, what underlies these. Then there is um, the, the issue of equity in access, uh, talk about healthcare. Uh, avoidable mortality, avoidable hospital admissions, uh, the whole thing that governs how, pe how people are discharged from hospitals. Um, I, I think that many people who work in the system will know what I'm referring to. Um, then there's this issue of epidemics uh, and response to natural disasters. Hong Kong hasn't actually experienced any uh, natural disasters like, for example, um, New Orleans, but if we did have a hurricane, um, will the same thing happen, that people who live in OH homes will just drown because there's no system, they're not identified early, there's no um, emergency response to deal with them as a separate category. Uh, should we have um, a system to identify vulnerable elders? Uh, I think some of the work that we did with uh, Professor Rodwin and Michael Guzmano have, uh, we, we've used, adopted their system of identifying vulnerable elders in New York and adapted it to Hong Kong. So maybe we should have a spatial pattern of, of locating where these people are so that it, in case we have natural disasters, we can have a decent response, uh, emergency response looking after them. Um, and then the issue of Autonomy and societal good is, is, is very important in epidemics. Should you look after yourself or should you sacrifice yourself to look after others? And SARS was a very good example. If you looked at what happened in Hong Kong and compared it to what happened in Taiwan, where doctors disappeared, some, some disappeared, <laughs> um, you, you can see that the, the, there is a difference in, in the cult, culture and the ethical principles. But what about um, the issue of quality of care and infection control measures? The two, actually, there are many, many conflicts. You, you focus on infection control measures and the quality of care for older people, actually, it, it, um, it, it's very bad. And SARS is another example, and many geriatricians would know what I mean. Uh, and then finally, in terms of policy and resource, you have you know what the infection control measures are, but there are no resource. And, and this is a personal dilemma that many people face. Um, so, so you can see that, um, that there are many uh, examples where uh, how to meet these ethical um, dilemmas would be very useful. And uh, finally, I, I will go on to the, the, the question of the health, health system, redesigning health care systems to meet aging populations. Um, a few years ago, we, we did a public survey of how people, people uh, pub members of the public and healthcare professionals would rank services for elderly and end of life services, services for the dying. And um, we compared it with London and um, uh, both places rank services for the young babies, the top. Um, 
both places ranked services for the elderly much lower, and Hong Kong was much lower. Uh, but curiously, uh, services for the dying was ranked, uh, I think, number two in London, but it was ranked really near the bottom in Hong Kong. Uh, the number two for Hong Kong is technological, uh, development of technology. Okay. So, so you can see these, these observations in our society uh, raise many, many ethical questions. And I hope that uh, during the course of today and tomorrow, we can debate them so that our policy, what we actually do, are firmly founded on strong ethical principles, which of course have to be agreed on in the first place. But I think, I think the ethical, do ethical principles differ between different societies? I don't know. There's no gold standard, there's no absolute. What does Hong Kong society, what is the view of Hong Kong society? It may be different from that in Shanghai or Singapore. So you can see that um, we, have, we have many, many things to discuss. So with that, I'll, I'll finish. Is this microphone working? Can you hear me? Okay, very good. So uh, we are going to uh, spend the next several minutes uh, entertaining questions from the audience. Um, so I believe there are microphones uh, in the aisle. So if, if you have a question, if you could please uh, make yourself known to someone with the microphones, we would be happy to engage uh, in discussion. Uh, critiques and comments are welcome as well, yes. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. Philip Baer from Hong Kong U. Uh, perhaps to, to start off, uh, what, one of the things that was mentioned by Professor Jim Wu and was raised was this notion of resources. But I, I find that very irritating for a place like Hong Kong when we keep saying where resources are limited and yet we run budgetary you know, excesses every year on year on year on year. So that, that's the first question. Are, are we really so short of money? Or are we just not prepared to use it? The, the second question is perhaps a bit tongue in cheek, but perhaps uh, as you were proposing this morning, to be really uh, pushing the limits. Can I be so bold as to ask, do we really have a policy on elderly in Hong Kong at all? Thank you. Whether Hong Kong has enough money is not actually an ethical question. <laughs> so uh, I think maybe we skip on to the, the next one. Is, um, sorry, I forgot what the next one is. <laughs> is there a policy on it? Oh, OK. Well, um, we, we have uh, lots and lots of documents uh, throughout the years about uh, how to look after elderly population. Uh, whether you, you call them policy, and not really sure, it depends on who is in charge. Maybe uh, I can ask Professor Alfred Chen, uh, uh, Chen of the Elderly Commission, to um, make some comments. This is a really good question indeed. Uh, it is also an ethical question for me. Uh, so uh, uh, basically, I think uh, if you ask my view, my view is that we don't have a collated um, uh, or coordinated policy yet in Hong Kong. And we make this a priority for the Elder Commission to make that happen within the next two years. And we have the mandate from the chief executive, uh, you know, from his uh, last year's uh, the policy address. So we are hoping to make that uh, better within these two years. So thank you for very much for that question. I just wanted to make one brief remark on the first point, because I actually do think, uh, do we have enough money can be turned into an ethical question fairly easily in the following sense. Uh, one of my former colleagues at Columbia, who is now a dean, I don't know why anyone becomes a dean, nothing, nothing personal, <laughs> Dean Chen, but she's, she's now a dean at NYU and um, uh, wrote a book called Chronic Condition. Sherry Gleed uh, argued, as many economists argue, that if one day the United States started spending 20% of its gross domestic product on healthcare, that would be just fine. Uh, 
She didn't understand what the problem was. There's nothing inherently wrong with spending a certain percentage of a society's disposable income on health care or long-term care or perhaps housing supports. Uh, these are value choices. How are you going to spend the resources you have? How are you going to invest them? Um, the Dan Callahan argument about age rationing care often presumes a sort of fixed pot of resources and then thinks about the allocation decisions within the society and also makes some other assumptions that I'm going to talk about in, in the next panel, so I won't get into now. Uh, but uh, if you look historically and you, you look back a century or more uh, at the percentage of our resources that were dedicated to addressing basic needs, housing, shelter, or food, what you find uh, is that because of changes in technology, we used to spend a lot more of our time and energy and resources just trying to feed ourselves and, uh, uh, and house ourselves and, 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 and develop clothing. Uh, and we now spend a fraction of that. And so one might ask, why not? If we, if we want more health care, spend more money on health care. Of course, and we'll get into this in some of our other panels, that doesn't mean we should spend it uh, inefficiently or unwisely because you're wasting resources and raising important opportunity costs for society if you are not spending that well. But what it means to spend it well uh, also very much depends on what the goals of a health care system are. And that's another thing that I think we're going to be debating uh, over the next two days that relates directly to your question about do we have enough money? Do we have enough money for what? What is it we're trying to achieve in health care and in social care? I just have a question for the question because my, my sense was that in Hong Kong you say you have a surplus and therefore you have enough money, but my, my recollection was that you're not such a high spender in health care in Hong Kong compared to other OECD countries. So what, what, what is this, what are you spending as, as a percent now? Remind me of, of a local GDP in Hong Kong. I think it's rather low. Who, who's got the figure? Hmm? Five, five percent is very low, so I'm, I'm not sure how to interpret your, your question that there's a, such a surplus here. This, this seems to me an accounting framework. You're actually not spending very much in Hong Kong on health care. Does anyone have a microphone? Or? Do we have a microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, hello, I'm Alice Chong from City University of Hong Kong. I would like to continue the discussion that we have just done about we facing aging population and whether we have enough money. I think the issue, of course, is we are not spending enough considering the low uh, percentage of uh, spending on health care. But my question is, what's the priority and who made the decision about the priority? I mean, in Hong Kong, just like in a lot of uh, our uh, communities, if you ask all the people, they will prefer, I mean, to uh, stay at home. But then in Hong Kong, a lot of time in terms of uh, taking care of the long-term care, they focus the money spent in residential care. And then another thing is, a lot of uh, public resources are spent in hospital care. But why shouldn't we spend more on preventive health so that people can self-manage and have a really quality life during their later life. So the question is, of course, maybe we need to talk about expanding uh, the percentage of resources, but not in health care, but rather in health promotion and in services that are outside hospital and that will fit with I mean, people's expectation. That's one, uh, one remark. Another uh, actually uh, comment is about, uh, Jean has mentioned about the, our services for dying person. I, uh, besides the I mean, quality of care for dying uh, patients, I think the issue in Hong Kong is a bit more complicated in the sense that uh, a lot of well, Chinese people have a tendency to avoid talking about end of life issues have a tendency, have a great reservation to talk about death and dying. So 
when we uh, think about uh, quality of care in the uh, end of life issues, professionals, doctors, social workers, nurses, as well as people in the general public have a tendency of uh, not having open discussion in the issues. So how, how, how could we make ethical considerations when we don't know what people are thinking about? Thank you. Well, um, I, I don't have a comment about this issue of, uh, of uh, how you distribute. Uh, let, let me just talk about health, healthcare first. How, how you distribute resource uh, for different healthcare systems. Now, um, if you remember what uh, Victor said about avoidable mortality, that's actually a very strong indicator of whether your primary healthcare system is working or not. Um, uh, unfortunately, Hong Kong does not do so well in that indicator when you compare with other cities like Paris, London, uh, and London. And it, it's actually not, not surprising because our system is really uh, well, sec a hospital base. We, we don't actually have a, a decent uh, primary care system, uh, a, a sort of uh, e equal, equally accessible type primary care system. Um, um, and and the uh, the other thing you mentioned about people avoid I mean and, and dying people do avoid, uh, but I, I think um, we, I, I think that the hospitals are beginning to look at that, uh, but I think it is a, it is a um, a difference between what people the lay public would like to see and what the service provider think that they need. I mean, in the area of care of dying, this is a really very good example of um, a sort of very paternalistic attitude on the time, on, on, in the place of the healthcare professionals, uh, I would say even among geriatricians, uh, to what people actually want. And if you, if you delve into it and ask people what they want, start talking to them, um, and then you run press conferences on this topic, you see a groundswell of opinion that is totally different to what the healthcare providers want. So, so I, th I think that we need to have more dialogue between um, the, you know, the, the society as a whole, and uh, th that would influence policy. Uh, maybe, Victor, you'd like to say something? Um, it, it, it's so, so difficult to, to make these international cultural comparisons. I, I, I was struck when I first looked at survey research in the US and Hong Kong just on how the self-perception of health was different. You ask the Hong Kong population, and this is well documented, to assess their health, and they have very high rates of self-assessed poor health. You ask the Americans to assess their health, and they have very high rates of excellent health. You look at life expectancy at birth, and it's far higher in Hong Kong than it is in the United States. So there, right away, you see there's a very different. Now, in spite of that difference, with respect to death and dying, my sense is that in all societies, at least the ones I'm most familiar with, there's a great reticence to deal with these issues. And certainly, in the United States, as well as in Hong Kong, there's a new book very engaging reading by Atul Gawande, I think it's called Mortal Choices, beautiful set of essays on this question, uh, particularly the chapter on letting go, uh, which, which describes these issues very well and I think would interest you given your question uh, on, on how to begin making this dialogue uh, possible even among the medical profession. Uh, as Jean says, there's a strong bias in favor of paternalism here, but, but uh, this, how, how to change that, I, I, I think it's changing. I mean, it, it, it's changing, uh, be, well, we could discuss why it's changing, but our, our capacity keeps improving to keep people alive no matter what without paying much attention to the quality of life. And as that capacity continues to increase, uh, there's a reaction from families of people who are being kept alive uh, and from people who are thinking of their own deaths, uh, 
that uh, as to what to do to avoid that, I think. And, and it, it's taking, I, I think probably it's, it, it's moving a little faster in the US from what I hear you say than in Hong Kong, but, but there's much work to be done. And of course that raises many, many, many ethical issues which would be a good subject, uh, maybe even for the panel on chronic disease, but later on in the conference. I'm Han Lam Lee, uh, Department of Philosophy, uh, CHK. Uh, I, I want to raise this question to Professor Rodwin. Uh, thanks for your inspiring keynote speech. Uh, you mentioned about the fact that uh, in large cities, uh, there is um, inequality. And I just want to, to mix two related uh, comments. And there is, the first one is, uh, of course, cities are, are not a product of capitalism, but big cities are. And, um, and I think there's some thing had to do with the internal logic of capitalism, uh, because capitalism consists of um, capitalists on the one hand, and also on the other hand, wage labor. And of course, this, this symbolizes wealth and, and the lack of it. And so um, I, I want, therefore, to, to raise uh, this point, and that is, in order to understand um, the inequality in, in big cities, we, we have to look at uh, the internal logic of capitalism. And, and the second related, a second point is that uh, mention, you mentioned about healthcare inequality or perhaps in, inequity. I just want to uh, suggest perhaps this question cannot be divorced from a larger question of uh, social, socioeconomic uh, inequality uh, in general. Thank you. I think you make a fair point, although I would disagree with you in part. That is, I agree with your final statement that you cannot separate that from socioeconomic context. As far as whether this is unique to capitalism, I'm not sure. I, I remember a powerful analysis by a Hungarian sociologist when Hungary was still clearly within the socialist mode on the uh, stratification and inequality within the socialist city particularly with concern to housing. He didn't look at that. So I'm reminded of the quip uh, made by uh, Schumpeter that, that capitalism is the exploitation of man by man and socialism is the opposite. Uh, <laughs> but you know, in, in this respect, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure that this is a distinctive feature. I mean, clearly there are capitalist uh, particularities in cities, but this is not a uniquely uh, capitalist phenomenon. Uh, Besides, uh, today the world is largely capitalistic, with very small exceptions. Uh, so, yeah. so I'm not sure that we have. It, it's a it's a useful differentiating uh, factor. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'm really dealing with your question, but I accept your broader term that which will, which I just began to unpeel, but that one has to look at the socioeconomic context uh, of these cities. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'd like to. To continue with this discussion, is that one, one assumes that if in capitalist country there are people who are richer and the people who are poorer. So the the, the richer, they, uh, everything is better health. But if you look at Hong Kong, um, uh, we we actually don't see this close correlation. Uh, if if you look at uh, just what Victor was saying, that our health indicators are pretty good compared to. Uh, other countries, uh, if you look at uh, people who were born in 1921 in Hong Kong, so they'd be 80 something now, uh, you look at all the, the physical, functional, and you know, cognitive things, uh, and compare with a cohort in UK, the Newcastle cohort, they, they published some data. Uh, we're, we're much better than that. I mean, all the anthropometric, you know, we have less obesity and less disease and so on. But if you look at self rated health, it's worse than the UK. Now, so, so what I'm saying is that other than money and things like that, there's a, there's a vague something, maybe a psychological factor, maybe cultural, maybe a societal happiness <laughs> uh, that influence how you rate yourself. But, but unfortunately, self-rated health actually is a very, very, very strong health predictor. 
because it takes into account psychological factors. So if you're not happy all the time, you can actually have, have worse outcomes. So I think we, we have to pay attention to self-rated help. So there's some things that we, we don't quite understand. Uh, it's uh, obviously money and everything is important. But even, even if you rate your, if you assess one socioeconomic indicator, that is not objective, like how much income, uh, what's your occupation, education level. It's how, how you rate your standing in the community. If you use that um, sort of in the ladder. Uh, all the older people and women rate themselves much higher than men, uh, whereas the opposite is true for uh, objective incomes. So, so there is this psychology of social comparison status. You know, are you the vice president of Chinese University of Hong Kong? I mean, you know, if you that 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 kind of psychological variable that that is also important in the equation. Just one quick comment on on this, and then we can go on to the next question. Um, in, in our last book together, Victor and I looked uh, compared health systems in New York, London, and Paris. And we think it's an interesting comparison in part because it's like a what social scientists love is a natural experiment because we have very similar cities in many ways with big uh, economic inequality in each. Uh, but one has a national health service, one has a national health insurance system, and then I, I don't know how to describe the US and I've been studying it for 20 years, but it doesn't have either of those things. Um, and one of the things that we found were there were much greater health and healthcare inequalities within New York than there were in either London or Paris, which is to say that while the economic activity of global cities, which do attract the wealthiest and the poorest, matter enormously uh, and are sort of inherent problems faced by all of those cities, uh, they are problems that can be addressed. They are amenable to intervention. And our point in comparing New York, London, and Paris was to say that the national policies explicitly designed to address inequalities in health and healthcare made a big difference. They did matter. And so um, there are some that look at global cities and suggest that some of the social and health problems associated with them are inevitable uh, because of economic competition within the cities, and we, we dispute that. Uh, th thank you, Michael, because I, I, I didn't want to leave you with the thought that it's the same all over. I was, in, in my initial opening, stressing the convergent aspects to set it up, but of course, there are many divergent characteristics across these cities. We even have distinguished in the literature soft and hard global cities. And, and that, that's what makes the comparisons interesting, particularly for the really big cities emerging in the uh, BRIC countries today. Do they want to follow the example of London, Paris, or do they want to follow the example of New York? London actually is a little closer to New York. But, but uh, well, and, and where will, uh, well, what will the Hong Kong model be? I mean, the Hong Kong model, as Jean Wu described it, and I, that's you know, my impression of exactly what it is, is, is a system, it's a really unique system, and, and it's uh, bizarre in its uniqueness because it affords access to everyone in a public hospital system, which leads to overcrowding, and it doesn't provide the services to everyone in basic primary care, which is a crazy way to design a system. I don't mean to be critical from the outside, but, but if, if, you're go, if, if you're going to try to contain costs and provide the right services, you want, you want to do actually the opposite <laughs> and say, say, save the hospital for those who really need it and make sure that the primary care system is covered for everybody. But the fact that people have to pay out of the pocket for basic care means that they tend to go to the hospital when they shouldn't be going to the hospital. And this is particularly serious for older people, as Jean Wu has been saying in, in her work for years. Uh, Ike Ye from the uh, Faculty of Medicine, Chinese University of Hong Kong. I think the issues about, uh, about spending in healthcare and the health systems is quite pertinent, uh, particularly in, in Asia, because we've done the a, a review of Asian countries. And when you look at uh, the, the countries in Asia, none of the countries with a social, without a social health insurance system spend enough money on healthcare. No. And of course, it's a question of the decisions that prioritization by government. We have in Asia a lot of pluralistic or mixed health systems. And in those systems, obviously, there's a lot of inequity. Because the, the data shows that the poor use private services as much as the rich. Uh, because the, the public systems are inadequate. 
So in those sort of systems, the inequity is even greater. And the other problem we have in Asia is that the governments don't even recognize this in, in, in equity. You, when you ask any government in Asia, they'll think they're very equitable. I've never seen a government in, in, in Asia that has openly said they're in equity in our system. They think they're doing a lot for the for, for, for populations uh, because they, they, are, they have uh, services for the poor. So we, we have uh, a system, our policy is that uh, that we don't, nobody goes without adequate medical treatment because of lack of means, because you have a, a, a means test, a system that supports people. But in those sort of systems, the, there's great deals of inequity uh, in, in systems, and, and they have not really been looked at in, in great detail, but they have been comparative studies. But ultimately, all the issues we talk about is about policies, it's about accountability. It's, it's a question that I have, is the, what are the ethics of accountability? The, the people that are doing, supposed to be doing their jobs, if, how are they accountable for the things that they're supposed to be doing? Because ultimately in health systems, you're talking about the governance of the system. And in that governance and leadership, that must reside in, in, the, in the government's role. And uh, do we question in terms of how that accountability is being done, uh, in terms of the the stewardship role that WHO talked about, that, that stewardship role is quite useful in thinking about that you entrust with something that society has given to you. They entrust you to have policies that will address these inequities. And if, if those, those responsibilities are not dealt with, what are the ethical issues involved? I think the ethics of politics is, is quite important. Uh, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure with, with your own experiences, it would be quite interesting to, to th see what you how we should be dealing with that. While you think about how to respond to EK, uh, can I also add to that to, to really say uh, one thing about Hong Kong which is strikingly different from the UK where I was trained in Jean as well, uh, is that uh, there is really quite a significant private market and almost half the doctors are actually in the private market. And they are doctors who are trained obviously in the, mostly in the two universities here and worked in the public system for many years. So in fact, it's very close. It should really be one system. But when we're planning, often it is actually very separate. And, and people, the doctors actually know if you're working within the HA, we have certain ways of planning and thinking and practicing, which is at a very high standard, but it's extremely resource uh, tight. You know? so, so that's what we do. We provide what we call the safety net. And, and it's very good, for, especially for serious illnesses. Um, but then a lot of patients, you know, obviously a lot of conditions are looked after in the private sector, but that is actually completely a separate system. And I think we're at a critical point when the government is trying to plan things more together and make more use of the private sector resources because it's, it's, it's there. It's just uh, uh, currently, uh, because it's the market, uh, as, and I think I will speak a bit slower here, it's a bit more sensitive because that's very market driven. The rents are high, the hospitals are expensive, and so on and so forth. And that's a historical model. So actually a lot of private people probably want to change that too. But there's a lot of resistance when it comes to voting and things. So my question to you is, how can a city like Hong Kong uh, from the government's point of view, really put everybody together so that it's, it's, it's to have you know, the, the kind of dialogue that we need and then the policies that we need so that everything can be regulated, which goes back to actually UK's question. How can we make people accountable? Because currently, doctors, unless we do something seriously wrong, uh, there is actually not a lot of accountability. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, we can go back to my first comment is that, uh, yeah, I mean, I think ethics is very important. Uh, it should be a very important underpinning of uh, policy, people who make decisions. Um, but how do they, uh, I think everybody who in the position of, of power uh, allocate resources and so on, they, they all try to do their best, right? But uh, how do they get these ideas? What influence their decision, their ultimate decision? Uh, I, I doubt whether it's a, through a rigorous consideration of ethical principles that I mentioned, or maybe they all subscribe to Daniel Callahan's po point of view that they, they, they're kind of, a lot of people are, are, are subconsciously influenced uh, 
about that. They don't even realize it. So they they um, put all the resources into babies and you know high technology and stuff like that. Uh, is it a subconscious thing? Uh, is it a cultural thing? I mean, I, I've met lots of people socially who, who think that, but they don't understand that they consciously think that there's anything, there's no ethical question in that. Um, that, that is why I say that we've got to think about this. Because if you subscribe to that point of view, uh, we can forget about all this argument. We can scrap the elderly commission, for example. <laughs> I mean, but, 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 but if you, if you don't, then don't be half-hearted, right? Don't have an elderly commission and then sort of uh, not highlight all these issues. But I, I, I think that I sense that um, uh, over the past, 20, 30 years, I, I, I actually, the, the, you know, I think we're going swinging in the direction of, um, you know, looking at this properly. Uh, I think the uh, uh, Alfred's done a great job in pushing a whole lot of things, and uh, but 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 I, I don't think it's from an ethical consideration. I, I think it's a it's like putting out the fire perspective. We're being flooded. I mean, it is this pessimistic thing. We've been flooded, the hospital's been flooded, a and has been flooded by patients, though we don't know what's wrong with them because everything's wrong with them, and they can't go home. They can't go home, so they get stuck in hospital, and we can't get police to put them back home. Uh, and so there's this crisis. I mean, every winter, we're experiencing this crisis now. <laughs> um, so so I, I think it's a really it's very, very, very important. I, I'm very keen. Uh, you know, we're supposed to be a democratic society, but make your decisions on ethical principles, on 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 based on facts, uh, and not uh, kind of sort of opinions about uh, you know who, who's useful and who's not. Uh, well, thank you for a wonderful panel. I'm Robert Klitzman from Columbia University. I think the issue is that we're always making ethical decisions in the context of culture. And I think culture is an important element that we need to take account of. Uh, you asked earlier, Professor Wu, uh, correctly, I think, do we share the same ethical principles? Uh, I think we do, but the way that we interpret them and apply them uh, and weigh them differs uh, based on cultural issues. And I think the key thing is, as you're suggesting, is that I would argue that in policy making, we're always reflecting our values, but that we would like to ideally to make that explicit so that we can explicitly pull out how we're thinking about the ethical issues underlying what we're doing. So a, a few specific examples, for instance. So uh, with self-assessment, the fact that people self-assess their health differently, I would argue that the meaning of health varies between cultures and so self-assessment. So for instance, some people somaticize. Uh, they won't say, uh, for instance, there are studies that show that rates of depression, of self-reported depression, are much higher in the West than in China. But in China, people will often, as I understand, say, you know, I have bodily aches and pains, uh, which may reflect in other people's minds symptoms of depression, for instance. So may, people may perceive their health differently based on psychological issues, I would which again suggests health. The issue of uh, uh, justice, for instance, also inequality is very much open to interpretation. So in other words, what is just in a healthcare system? Uh, there are those in the United States who say just is everyone gets the same. Others say just is based on how much you put into the system. If you put more money in the system, you should get more money out of the system. Uh, we think that justice is to give everyone a certain amount of health care, but as being debated in the United States and elsewhere, how much should that be? How much should Obamacare in the U.S. give to people as basic services? We've not yet decided. And again, we all agree that equality is the principle, but what that means practically can vary greatly. Uh, so again, I just think that uh, it's important to be aware of how uh, culture affects ethics, since ethics takes place in culture uh, and affects how we think about the ethical issues. And I think the more we can discuss that in the next few days, that would be great. We've suddenly inspired questions from the entire audience. Oh, sorry, yeah. Oh, Alistair Campbell from National University of Singapore. I'd like to return to um, 
Professor Lee Hon Hon Lee's um, point about capitalism and um, and deal with Victor's you know, uh, inadequate response to it. <laughs> so um, uh, when we're talking about equity, I think this is well known, often said, we can't distinguish between issues of equity um, uh, um, and uh, other issues related to the effectiveness um, and the use of resource. So we can't, we can't debate the equity question without looking at the, the way in which the system is provided. And this is, I think, where we come back to market issues and capitalist issues um, and the, your comparators between the three cities, for example, demonstrate that uh, a market system in healthcare is going to be, always going to be inequitable because it's extremely inefficient. It wastes resources. And, and that's why national healthcare systems uh, provide better value. And that's why we shouldn't be keep pouring money into systems that are actually wasting uh, the resource because of capitalist principles. So um, it's interesting that in the United States, of course, I've lived and worked in the States as well as other countries in the world, that um, this um, national health system is described as socialist medicine. Um, well, maybe it is, but the fact is that's the one that works. None of them work perfectly. Um, we have massive problems in the UK now with our health service. Um, so I'm not saying this is the answer. But I don't think we can avoid the problem of the marketization of healthcare. And this is a global phenomenon. And it affects uh, the delivery of healthcare massively, certainly here in Asia. The other, the other thing there is this problem between primary and secondary care, which is, is a major issue also in Singapore, as it is in Hong Kong, which is that because in, in Singapore, the primary care has been largely left to private providers, whereas uh, there, there's government provision at secondary and tertiary care, you have exactly this difficulty that you, you simply are creating problems by not providing appropriate provision at the primary care level, which I believe is probably one of the major problems in New York as well. Good morning. Um, Professor Mimi Zhao from the Faculty of Law at uh, CUHK, and I'm a member also of the um, CUHK Jockey Club Institute of Aging. Um, my question is, how do we think about the ethics of healthcare inequality in global cities and its link with the ethics of global inequalities in healthcare provision? So I, I've looked at um, global health migration in my research. And I think this is, um, for global cities, obviously not only is it a hub for global migration across different sectors, across different skill sets, um, which has implications uh, for the pressures on healthcare systems in these cities, but also the healthcare professionals around the world who are flocking to these global cities. What does it mean for the global south, in particular, uh, where these, a lot of these countries are also going to be facing the sort of challenges of ageing in the next century? Uh, your reflections on this uh, would be uh, appreciated. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not only moderating, I've been asked to reflect on that, so, so I, will, I will reflect. Uh, well, I, mean, I, think, I think you raise an important point, uh, which is that what, I mean, getting to some of the important and relevant differences among global cities, which are important in addition to looking at differences in culture and reflecting on how cultural context affects how we think about ethics. Um, as we say at the Hastings Center, no good ethics without good facts, and one of the important facts to confront within uh, comparisons of global cities is the speed of change uh, 
uh, particularly in the global south. So not only resource differences, but there is enormous time pressure. The fact that uh, many of these uh, countries in this region are aging so rapidly means that there is a, a, an enormous amount of pressure that must be grappled with in terms of putting together systems that would be appropriate to provide ethically sound care to address the needs of the population in a time frame that uh, the cities and the countries uh, uh, in Europe and the United States did not have to confront, uh, right, where you had a century to go from systems primarily focused on acute care uh, illness to ones that also are grappling with chronic disease. So I think it's a major challenge as it raises ethical questions. I don't know that we have good answers for it, but it is something that's important to recognize when thinking about lessons across the globe. Uh, I'm Dr. Dr. Ernest Ma from CUHK uh, with training background in respiratory medicine, rehab medicine, and acute medicine. Uh, this topic is, it seems uh, to be, um, uh, from my perspective, have not defined what is health. And then we didn't define uh, the so-called a gold standard health system. And then how can we, how can we compare the ethical challenges in the global cities? It seems to be uh, we're comparing how bad with the other best. Uh, I, what I'd like to raise is, uh, say, uh, when we like to uh, look at the health system challenge, let's look at the, when we face aging, let's look at the, the, you know, there are at least five longevity villages over the whole world, one of which is in China, the Burma village. Mm -hmm. And the average age is easily 100 and 100 to 20. And then there are many qualities in those villages. So cities does, may, may not do, do good to our health. Maybe a better topic is a disease system challenge in global cities. Because in our modern cities and Western-based system, it's mainly disease-based model. And as we all know, the integrated medicine, Chinese medicine, they look at the sub-health and then going backward. So when there's actually not just the absence of health, but positive health, just like the WHO is uh, emphasizing. So there's my a few comments, and then if we like to define what is, what is really ethical, uh, first we define whether cities are doing harm or rather than doing good, and then see whether pay, the people have autonomy to choose the city life and also the better health, healthier life. And then, uh, and then before we talk about justice. Okay. John Leza from Kutztown University of Pennsylvania and uh, visiting in the Department of Philosophy at uh, CUHK. Uh, Professor Rodwin, you, you had um, uh, mentioned social determinants of health, which might include uh, income inequality and uh, educational level. Uh, environmental factors. And my question is just compared to access to health care and delivery of health care, how significant are these other factors? And do you have any concern that the attention to, to uh, access to health care or attention to administration of health care may serve as a distraction to addressing some of these other determinants? Um, if we think of the analogy of the boat, if the boat is rocking and there is a way to calm the sea, then maybe we don't have to throw people overboard. Um, that's, that's a very big question, and of course I see where you are coming from. I share the epidemiological social determinants of health WHO position that uh, the social determinants account for 80% or 75% or if you like 90%. And so therefore, all of our attention should go to the social determinants. It's easy to say, it's hard to do. And even if it's true, and I do believe it's true, it doesn't mean that one shouldn't intervene for the 10%, because the 10% the are people who need care, uh, for whom you can, you can provide help, and we have systems designed to do it. So one does not exclude the other, but of course we spend disproportionately on the medical care system compared to uh, setting right, uh, you know, raising educational levels and eliminating poverty. Uh, these are much harder things to do and much more difficult to get consensus about how to do them and even whether to do them. 
So, so uh, there, there's no answer to that. I, 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 but I, I would not go so far as to say that because the social determinants are the most important driving factors, we should just forget about access to care because I believe access to care matters and we have systems which can provide that. It, 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 it's, maybe Michael can add to that. No, I was just, um, I think I, I would love to, but uh, we, need to, we need to stop and we need to end there. So I want to thank all of you for an extraordinarily <laughs> lively session. Uh, uh, the, the good news, or perhaps the bad news, is I'm on the next panel as well, and so you can repose these questions to me again. Uh, so I would like to thank Dr. Rodwin, Dr. Wu, uh, for their wonderful remarks, and thank all of you for participating in this session. Thank you. Thank you.